Hi, I'm Aviva Rumani, and welcome to episode 31 of Kindred Cast, Lion Tree's bi weekly podcast featuring insights from deal makers and thought leaders from the world of tech, media, and everything in between. On today's show, we feature a sit down interview with Lion Tree CEO Arya Borkoff and the extremely talented music executive Larry Jackson, Apple Music's head of content. Listen as he goes deep into his very early start in the music industry the future of Apple Music, and what it's like working with artists like Drake, Whitney Houston, Jennifer Hudson, Lana Del Rey, and Aretha Franklin. This conversation has a lot of soul. I hope you enjoy. Hi, everyone. It is my pleasure to be sitting down with Larry Jackson. Larry Jackson is Apple Music's head of content, and all around one of the coolest and most connected guys that I know in the music and technology industry. I've known Larry for a long time, and I'm excited to share with all of you an inside look into his career, hear about his start in music, and what the future of music and content looks like. Larry joined Apple in June of 2014 to work on Apple Music. Larry was, before that, working at Beats and an A&R executive at Interscope with Jimmy Iovine. He's 37 years old and has received many accolades as a 40 under 40, but continue to be impressing and growing. And it is my pleasure to be sitting here in his beautiful home in California. Thank you for hosting me and thank you for being on Kindred Cast, Larry. It's my pleasure, my privilege. Good afternoon, good morning, whatever time it is you're listening to this at. That's right. That's right. My radio voice. So, no, I used to be in radio back in the day, man. Really? Yeah, I was at a station uh, called KML in San Francisco, which is why it's kind of like, I wish I had the headphones because I could really hear like whether or not like I was like in, what do they used to call those shows? Uh, quiet storm mode, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, right in your ear. Yeah, right in your ear, like 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. You, you do know? have a bit of a soothing voice, actually. Yeah, it's, you know, it's all kind of like a learned thing from my days in radio. You know, because I used to do Quiet Storm type broadcasts and whatnot. And I was mm-hmm. 16 at the time. So that was what I was doing before I, I worked for Clive Davis. And that was my start in the record business. You know? Tell me about, like, where did you first develop a passion for music? Radio was it. So I was a kid coming up in uh, San Francisco and I loved music. And I would win radio contests all the time when I was like nine or 10 years old. My fingers were very nimble. Uh, this was pre like redial. I think like 90, 91, and I would just win concert tickets, everything I was winning. And after a while, I monopolized it to such a degree. They said, kid, you can't win anymore. So uh, they said, but what you can do, since you clearly have a passion for what we do, you can come down and you can get a tour. And that was a foot in the door. That's all I needed. You know what I mean? Just an invitation in. You know, I went from uh, what I believe they call it in the UK, a tea boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was making hot chocolate and tea and running to get people from the door, let them in rather. Then I became a board op. Someone would do, be doing a remote broadcast someplace and I was 14 running it back, you know, at the station with no adult supervision, which was like, you know, imagine being 14 and, you know, having that kind of shot, you know, to do that. That was like, that feeling still gives me goosebumps because I just remember how amazing that was for me to have that, to have that kind of belief but when you're in the room at 14 years old yeah. and you look at your surroundings, is it the fact that you're surrounding yourself with creative people or the artists or the music that really stimulated you? Or what was it? It was the opportunity to learn. I wasn't in a really small tertiary market. I was in the fourth largest market in, in the country and I was being given this responsibility. And uh, the magnitude of that was not lost on me. Because what came as a consequence and, and a result of that was I unfortunately didn't have a lot of friends growing up, you know, because I really dedicated myself to this in a lot of ways. And I wasn't a loner in any kind of way. I was really a, uh, a popular kid, but I just didn't really engage in any peer group type activities outside of cross country and track, which was more so at the time. And I didn't say this to anybody. It was much more so another part of the curriculum, especially cross country for me, because it's how I learned endurance and how to endure things and the psychology of that when you're in mile 13 and uh, you don't feel like running anymore and practice is 18 miles that day, but you got to make it back and you can't walk. And if you walk, you're a sucker. So that's just discipline. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. It bred a certain level of discipline in in, in me that um, I still carry today. And 
so that was the only peer group kind of that I had that I cultivated in high school. Other than that, I was just working. So yeah, at 14, I was doing that. And 15, I was doing the same thing. And then at 16, um, they made me um, the music director of the radio station. And then did you take on management responsibility at that point? Man, I wish I could actually grab the con. I just got the contract framed. My first contract that I ever signed at 16 years old, I got it framed. It's in the other room of my office. We'll get a photo of it because it's, uh, I look at it every day and it reminds me of where it all started at. My salary was $20,000 plus health benefits. You know, adjusted for inflation, I suppose, 20 years later, that's a good money. big deal, yeah, for a 16-year-old. But more um, than the money, it was really the responsibility that you had all of a sudden thrust upon you. Yeah, it wasn't really about the money. You know, I was living at home. I didn't even have a life, you know? So, <laughs> you know, the money was like for my car note to get from home to school to work, home, school, work. That was like the triangle. That yeah. was it, you know? I felt like that was my path. Yeah. And then how did you get to the A&R business? How did you get to Interscope? Is that through a relationship you had with Jimmy or, or did you seek it out? No, there's an important chapter for me, at least in between Interscope and radio, in that um, because I was a kid, I didn't really understand the rules of the road, so to speak. And being a music director, I just decided that I was going to play whatever I liked, you know? And it was a pretty ballsy thing looking back, being in market number four. And it was the most influential crossover station in the country at the time that all the labels looked at. It was the heyday of the record business and of that particular era, you know? CD era, you know, where they were printing cash. So all the guys, whether it be Matola, whether it be Donnie Einer, or whether it be Jimmy, or whether it be um, Jay Bolberg, who was at MCA, who treated mm-hmm. me incredibly well. And Clive Davis was a guy who was always looking at what I was playing while I was a music director. And he was seeing that I wasn't following the rules, but the things that I was choosing to step out on became big national hits and forced the labels to rethink what their strategy was for their artists on that particular single because what I stepped out on then thereafter, people in other markets around the country started following and then the labels had to change their strategy. So I was doing A&R work without even knowing that I was doing A&R work at the time. And Clive recognized that and saw that. And when I was 19, he called me and he had just had a record year at Arista where he had um, Santana Supernatural and Whitney Houston's My Love Is Your Love in the same year. He knocked it out of the park with Carlos Santana. He's on stage like Quincy Jones with Michael Jackson, the thriller year with all the Grammys in their hand. Yeah. And then a couple of months later, they oust him. He was 68 and they blamed it on the fact that there's like this mandatory retirement thing. From his perspective, and rightly so, he was having a banner year and they just pushed him out. But ultimately, it was about money, of course. And you produced a documentary film about this, right? Yeah, full circle. Yes, Went to sir. Tribeca last yes, year. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we launched Tribeca last year and... Uh, it was an incredible night and I'm in the documentary and it was great. You don't know where you're going unless you know where you're coming from. And I think, you know, if you look at the record business and look at it like it's Mount Rushmore, George Washington on the Mount Rushmore, the record business, Clive Davis is it, you know, followed by Geffen, you know, and Mo Austin and Ahmed Erdogan and Walter Yetnikoff and Jimmy Iovine, of course, you know. It was my privilege to be able to do that with Clive at, at Apple now. But in any event, back to being 19, Clive called me and said, hey, I just got ousted from Arista, and um, have you ever been to New York before? And I said, no, Clive, I've never been to New York. Well, I mean, this is the place you need to be. It's culture and Broadway and theater and, you know, museums and come on out. How about this? Just come to New York for a meeting. I'm starting I feel like a Clive label. just walked into your living room. I can finish the guy's <laughs> sentences, man, you know, because what happened thereafter is I worked with him for 10 years, actually, from 2000 to 2010, I started off as like a low-level manager of A&R at J Records and it was an incredible ride thereafter. I actually was, you know, one of the first couple employees at the company and, you know, helped him build the company in a lot of ways from a creative perspective. But he got you to move to New York. Correct, yeah. Yeah, when I was 19. So, But what happened actually before that, I should probably say, and I never would talk about this until last year so openly, but I didn't graduate high school. I got kicked out of high school during that period when I just got the job as a music director because a lot was thrust on me at a very early age. So I didn't understand how to manage my time correctly to take on both responsibilities at the same time. It's funny because I was actually, before I came here today, I was out down in uh, Boyle Heights at College Track, which is Lorraine Powell Jobs company, foundation rather. And Lorraine, basically with Will I Am, it's his chapter of College Track, 
I was asking them, I saw something on the wall while I was there today, and, I, and it was about uh, SAT scores and ACT scores. And I said to one of the kids who was giving me a tour, I said, what's ACT mean? And I realized I missed that whole part of my life. I didn't even know what an ACT test is. Wait till you have kids. That's all we talk about. <laughs> it made me appreciate the fact of how hard I rolled the dice on myself you yeah. know, at that particular point in time. Um, did you realize you were taking a big risk? I did, yeah. The grave impact of that was compounded by being expelled from school two months before I was due to graduate in my senior year. It was one of the most shell-shocking things that's happened to me in my adulthood, aside from losing loved ones. It's like getting fired for the first time. And here I am, a, a young man who's beloved. I'm doing great work. The kids love me at school, and you know I'm, I'm doing all right in terms of what I'm doing professionally. And it's like being terminated with cause. It thrusts me out into the real world without any harness. But you don't strike me as the kind of guy that gets down. You like a positive vibe. I was down about that. I was really down about it. It was sobering in the sense of, well, I guess, you know, this career that you roll the dice as hard on and you bet the farm on, you better take it seriously because now you're not a high school dropout, but you've been expelled from high school and you don't have a pivot plan because you didn't really foresee this happening. This better work out. So... I then became completely engulfed beyond. I was already, but was fully engulfed in what I was doing professionally. And I just had to figure it out. But it was important because it really, as you know, I guess from having kids, it's like you can go from being in high school and you can go to college and you can go to graduate school. And along that path, that trajectory, as a young person, you can very comfortably stay infantilized. You don't have to figure out what you need to do. I get a great scholarship. My dad, Arya, is really happy for me. I'm going away to college. I get to have fun with my friends. You know what I mean? Like the college years, I get to experiment. I get to not figure out what I want to do professionally or vocationally. I get to really kind of stay a kid for to like 22, 24 years old, really. All of that stopped for me when I was 17. Same for me. For different reasons. Yeah. But you're yeah. right. So You have to keep yourself independently minded. Yeah. As early as possible and yeah. not live in that fantasy. Yeah. And so get down to work. Get down to work. Yeah, I just turned 17 at the time and it was what I needed to take this shit seriously. Yeah. You know, can we curse on this thing? For sure. All right, great. <laughs> as long as it's to like... take this shit seriously. You can curse with soul. Yeah. No, not I not, to make not sure in that, gratuitous ways, you know? No, 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 no. That, that, was, that was meaningful. I was meaningful. So, yeah, that's how I got to Clive in New York, J Records. That was quite a ride after that. And let's talk about Interscope. Yeah, definitely. So how'd you get to Interscope? Interscope, can't remember how I met Jimmy. I think I met Jimmy through my friend Polo to Don, who was managed by Jimmy's nephew, DJ Mormilli, both of whom are still really good friends of mine. And Polo and DJ told Jimmy that he should meet me because I kept stealing Jimmy's records. And I think the last straw was when I had signed Leona Lewis and he had one Republic signed to Interscope. They're still signed there. My homie Ryan Tedder, who lives around the corner from here, actually wrote this song called Bleeding Love. And I ended up doing what I do. I got the song, cast it on Leona. The song went number one in 33 countries. Jimmy was like, all right, enough was enough. <laughs> <laughs> He's competitive. Yeah, enough was enough. He reached out right after that point, and we met, and... Um, I was still at J Records with Clive and I was in the middle of producing Whitney Houston's last album. And I just signed Jennifer Hudson and I won a Grammy at 27 for producing her first album, her debut album, which sold 2 million copies and did really well. And Jimmy was seeing all this and was like, you're stealing my records, you're doing pretty well. You know, why don't you leave that Clive thing alone and come out here? You know what I mean? And I'm making headphones. So Beats was already in process. Well, yeah, but he was the only employee, you know? <laughs> it was him and his camera. And his son, Jeremy. Right. And, uh, Andre. Andre, yes. That was what was going on. But I wasn't prepared to abandon what I had started, which is very important to me, not to abandon what one starts. It's a very important principle. And I had started that thing with Whitney, and we become really close. And it was important for me to finish producing her album, and even if that meant sacrificing an opportunity to work with someone who I closely admire, like Jimmy, I wasn't prepared to abandon that job with Whitney. I did the wrong thing. I made another youthful uh, decision. I negotiated a deal with Barry Weiss, who had just been appointed the chairman of RCA Music Group. Clive was pushed out again. And I accepted the job as president of Arista Records and the head of A&R, 27 years old. 
after moving to New York. And uh, they're paying Ten years me very ago. nicely. Ten years ago, yes, sir. But when I say I made another youthful mistake, I didn't have the right etiquette. And maybe this is not important. Maybe people don't do this and I'm just obsessing over something that's really not that big of a deal, but it's a big deal to me. And I didn't return the call. I didn't say, hey, I'm going to pass on this thing. You know, mm-hmm. It's not for me right now. I want to focus on this decade, yeah. these last 10 years for you yeah, yeah, and for all yeah, of us. But yeah. for you, from 27 to 37, yeah. the entire world changed. Yeah, yeah. You know, not only the music business yeah. collapsed and now is obviously on the resurgence. Yeah. But technology companies came into being in a much, much bigger way than when we were kids and certainly before 27 for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so everything happened in the last 10 years for you. And, 100%. And obviously is impacting you know, consumer behavior and the yeah. world at large, et cetera. Yeah. Last 10 years were very important for me because um, that was another period where I had to kind of force myself out of like this <sighs> complacency. Like you could sell out if you just stayed down the path of being an executive. For sure. I was working with Monica and Fantasia and signed Jennifer Hudson, Leona Lewis and Whitney Houston and Aretha Franklin. I produced her duets album and wrote the first single on the album. I was just a diva machine, man. You know what I mean? And loved all of them. And they were all very near and dear to me, you know? I felt like, you know, you could put a blindfold on me and I could go out there and make the three-point shot from midcourt still, you know what I mean? So I felt like... At a certain point when I was working with Britney Spears and I gave her this record Womanizer and it went from like 97 to number one on the Hot 100 in like record time, like the fastest ever. And then I had Jennifer at the same time. I just signed her and Clive tortured me about that album for two years straight. I was humiliated in the press. They said that Clive scrapped the album. It was in page six. And then I finished the album. Song goes to number one in the U.S. and the U.K., Leona was at the same time and right after Bleeding Love and Better in Time goes number one. And it's like, you know, I have three number one records at the same time. You have to You're shift not gears. Be f- throwing a parade in your honor, you know, as a result of this anymore. Right, you know but did I mean? you feel closer to the artist and the creative cycle than you did the executive path at that point? Like I said, the, my. Yeah, because I lived in the studio. Right. You know, the reason why I like being here is because. I like the light now, you know? And it's like, I used to stay in the studio till four or five o'clock in the morning, grab four hours of sleep, get back up, do my executive thing, be back in the studio later that night. And that was just like a cyclical thing, you know? Yeah, I was really close to the creative process. I was producing vocals. I was sitting down being like, nah, I don't like that take again. Or Aria, can you do that one more time? Like saying it like this, like, nah, I need a little bit more feeling from you, Aria. You know what I mean? Like that was my life you know, to be able to do that kind of thing. And I don't do that anymore because it wore me thin. And then to go and then like once the artist leaves, then take every single like line of that riff that they gave you, every dozen, 13, 14 takes of that, comp it down, listen to every single one of them, figure out which one you want, comp it together, figure out what the mix would be and then put it together and then you release it and it becomes a hit single. But even now with Drake's, I think one of his recent videos, you participated, you created that with him, right? Yeah, we've done a lot of work together, man. He's a friend of mine. I love that dude, man. We went to South Africa for Views, which was the biggest album of 2016. And uh, we decided that ultimately um, we would forego doing individual videos and put everything into like one kind of visual magnum opus piece. We wrote it together with my friend Anthony Mandler, who directed it with me. And we went to Johannesburg, South Africa and, and Soweto. And that's where the video for One Dance is in. And six other songs from views are encapsulated in this 22 minute visual magnum opus piece that still lives on Apple music today as an exclusive piece of content, uh, exclusive short film. So, you know, I, I never turned that part of it, but I just figured out like new ways to like express myself. Cause if I don't express myself in that way or find ways to express myself, then I feel like it's kind of like death, you know, boring, super like death. Yeah, like death. <laughs> it's a little nothing bit more like boring a, than death, right? I mean, obviously, it's a stimulating position that you're in. I mean, I want to get into Apple Music a little bit, but let's just keep focusing on the creative connection that you have with your friends, your artists, and you know, Drake is a great example because you really collaborate with the artists yeah. in a business sense. It's not just Drake; it's many others that you've described throughout your career. But that's the unique situation where you're sitting at a platform that has massive scale, a big executive position, yet you are aligning yourself with the artist. The industry has been struggling to get to that point as a business model, but you've been practicing that for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I have my Gladwellian 10,000 hours, you know, from sleeping on the couch of the studio, from cutting vocals to having a conversation with 
someone like Whitney, for instance, after spending five years in the studio and being like, okay, cool. We got two more songs to go on this album. So what's our marketing plan? I think we should do Oprah. Nah, baby, I ain't doing that. You know what I mean? And then like finessing that into actually happening, which became like a, you know, a legendary two-day interview that she did with her, which launched the album. We sold half a million albums in the first week. It's always been the proximity to that that's always been secret sauce to me. It's such a privilege, man. I have such reverence for the relationships. It's such a deep, 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 deep privilege, man, and that I want to honor it. And it's and I got fired for it. That's why I got fired from Sony. I mean, we want to talk about the last 10 years. I don't want to skip right into the Apple stuff if you really want to talk about it because what happened after I signed the contract and became president of Arista and head of A&R is that um, I realized that uh, I didn't do it for the right reasons. I realized I did it for money. And I realized that that would be the last time that I did that. I realized I really wanted to work with Jimmy, actually. I presented myself for taking the road most traveled and the path of least resistance. So what I ended up doing is most kids do because I was a kid, 27, 28, is I acted out. You know, I don't think I signed anything that precludes me from not talking about this. And I just talked to the general counsel from Sony today. So I hope she forgives me if I say something that's off base. She's a friend. Shout out to Julie Swidler. <laughs> I'm sure because of the shadow, I think you'll be fine. Yeah, I think I'll be fine too. <laughs> She's like a mom to me, man. Yeah, I mean, I acted out when I did something that... What did you do? Well, it kind of goes to your point about being close to the artist is that what happens when things become about the money, it becomes about the quarters, the fiscal year, meeting the numbers. And Sony was in a position at that particular time in 2010 where they needed to make... RCA Music Group specifically, where they needed to make the numbers. I was making the second album with Jennifer Hudson and... She was shooting this movie playing Winnie Mandela with Terrence Howard in Johannesburg. And I was over there making the album, working on it with Neo and Harvey Mason Jr. They needed the album like super quick. And I'm trying to like, you know, hand paint this thing and hand knit it like it's some piece of poetry. And they're like, no, we don't need poetry. You know, we need a Big Mac right now. I didn't know what to do when I was faced with that kind of pressure. So what I ended up doing was calling my friend Alicia Keys and I said to her, I need your help. You know, we just made this record with Whitney Houston called Million Dollar Bill. It went number one. I launched the album, blah, blah, blah. I would love to do something like that, but I don't want to do something like carbon copy. I have this idea of, a, of something I like to do that kind of feels like that, but this is the idea. So it connected with her creatively, but she said, I'm six months pregnant. I just got back from my honeymoon. Can this wait? I said, nah, I can't wait. Because they just come to me and said, you know, if we don't have this album. We won't meet the numbers. We won't make it. This will impact our year. Huh. That hit me in a way it was like, damn, like, if I don't do this, then I'm going to be blamed for the company not making its numbers. Because they already told me this album will either close the Delta or leave a gaping hole for it. So I said to uh, Alicia, no, this can't wait. <laughs> she said, well, let me think about it. So but that felt unnatural to you to be pushing that, pushing the creative it felt, cycle. I felt desperate. But I mean, there was very few people that I could have that kind of candid of conversation. And she was one of them. You know, because we had both started with Clive at the same time, we're the same age. She understood where I was coming from. So to that extent, she calls me up about two weeks later. She's like, where are you at? I was like, I'm out doing such and such right now. She said, can you come to the studio? You know what you asked me for two weeks later? I got the records done. And I got three of them. I said, what? She said, yeah, come to Germano. I'm on Broadway and Great Jones Studios, 767 Broadway Street. Can you come now? Yeah, I'll come there right now, I said. I came there, I heard the records, I was blown away by what she had delivered and so immensely flattered that she had paid for the studio time out of her own pocket. She was six months pregnant. She had just come back from her honeymoon and she had done this as a gesture wow. to me. So I called Clive that night and I said, Clive, we got it. And Clive was really album producer because Barry was running the company that time. She comes up for lunch the next day. We listen to the records. I didn't, unfortunately, ask Barry to come to the lunch because, and I love Barry Weiss. We're like, we're friends now, you know, he fired me. But like to hold grudges is like, I call it emotional obesity, you know, and I'm, I'd rather be light about it. So we've since been defenses and whatnot, but I didn't invite him to the lunch. And I think he may have felt a certain type of way about that because when he came in, it was this jubilant feeling of me and Alicia and Clive, and we just finished listening to the records and Clive was bragging about the fact that Alicia d delivered big time and she was really happy and he listened to the records and was kind of begrudgingly and ensued thereafter eight to 10 weeks of penny pinching and I don't want to pay this and this and that and like 
you know, I don't think she should da 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 da. This is why I don't want to go too deep on it, but you know, you get the gist, right? Yeah. So it goes on, it goes on, it goes on. And he said what he said. And I frankly should have respected that. But because I was upset that I had done the deal about the money and I really didn't want to be there anyway, my girlfriend at the time was signed to me at the time. And I felt like her record was not getting the kind of attention that it should have been getting. And I was being penalized and I felt like we weren't being taken seriously. I really begrudged the whole situation and I acted out as a result of it. Lisa, who was Oprah's executive producer at the time, she calls me the same day Alicia calls me, a week before Alicia gave birth to Egypt. I know this is a convoluted story, but there's a point to it. She says, got great news for you. I want to give you an hour on Oprah for Jennifer to debut her second album. I said, holy cow. Now I have the marketing launch pad and this guy doesn't even want to give me the money to get the records done. So I said, you know what? I got a bright idea. Let me just pay for what he doesn't want to pay her out of my own pocket. And they viewed that, which it was, frankly, as insubordinate. Yeah. And uh, I went in, cut the records, you know, because I ultimately felt like, okay, either way, you guys are going to blame me for not making your numbers for Sony anyway. I'm 29. I don't want to have that on my goddamn back. So I'm damned if I do. I'm damned if I don't. So I'd rather deliver and have that be the outcome. And that's what I did. I went in to cut the records. Alicia actually goes into labor in the studio that night, Thursday night, gives birth to Egypt the next day. I come in. We cut all three records. They sound fantastic. I have a meeting with Clive at 5.30. They call me to have a meeting with Barry at 5 o'clock. I walk in, still euphoric from the experience, and I see the head of HR sitting there with the president and uh, GM and Barry the chairman, and they tell me that what I did was grossly insubordinate, and I'm 14 months into a four-year contract, and I am effective immediately terminated with the cause. Security is waiting outside for me. They get my backpack from my office, and um, it was nice knowing you, kid. Then you think life was ending now, um, career ending. I didn't know. I wasn't sure. You know, all I knew was that I just got clocked in my right jaw, and had the wind knocked out of me. Didn't see had, it coming. I didn't see it coming. No, I thought I'd done something that was very giving on a personal level. I felt like I wanted to talk it out. I felt like I would have stayed too, you know? But I also, in retrospect, they did me the biggest favor they ever could have done for me. They freed me from a contract that I didn't even want to be in. They let me out immediately. Yeah, they set you free. They set me free and they let me become a competitor overnight. The first person who I talked to was Clive, who didn't know. He didn't give me any heads up. The second person I talked to was my lawyer. Third person I talked to was a litigator because I jumped in action. Another lawyer. Yeah, another <laughs> lawyer. And the fourth person I talked to was Jimmy Iovine, uh-huh. who told me, this is the greatest news. I want to come to work on Monday. Don't worry about a thing. This is going to be great. Did you call any artists? Did you call Alicia? Yeah, yeah. I talked to her after that. She was supportive and, you know, surprised and whatnot. One thing that Jimmy told me right before that, a month before that, because I was kind of already itching to go, to be honest with you. I said to him, you know, what about Alicia? What about Jennifer? What about Leona? What about... Whitney, you know, what about all these artists that I've cultivated these relationships with in this music that we've made together? And he said, you don't get it. You're your own fiefdom. And I didn't even understand what he was saying at the time, but now I get it. They will come with you or, Meaning, you, will, or you will build it again. If you're P.T. Barnum, you can erect a new tent someplace else. It's all good. Like, you don't have to stay tethered to that necessarily. If you're that good, you can recreate it someplace else. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Luckily, I was able to see enough past my insecurities to be able to embrace that and believe that the universe pushed me in a direction in a very violent way, by the way, and I had no choice but to embrace it. So, When you go in that direction and in life in those moments and overcome insecurities, it's, in retrospect, a path driven by self-assurance and corrective behavior and independence and entrepreneurial yeah. thinking and risk-taking. Yeah. But really what happened is... All that was catalyzed by someone that believed in you. Over the course of a career, you do lean on people once in a while. And in that case, you had a mentor. I had a mentor in Clive, you know, who was well served by my staying there, you know, and perhaps out of loyalty, had the universe not pushed me in that direction, I would still be there out of loyalty, perhaps. I, who knows? But, but then when you were vulnerable at that moment, Jimmy became a mentor. Instantly. Instantly. And you never forget it. Ever. You strike me as a very loyal guy to a select group of people that have been there for you at these critical moments. 
because until last year, I finally graduated from high school last year, you know? That was a very special and emotional moment for me. Congratulations. Full circle, you know? But I'm a young African-American guy who's out there on an eighth grade diploma. I'm out there without a harness, man. I'm doing like a high wire act of a very daring nature. If I fall, I have no safety net below me. Nothing to fall back on. I don't have a major. So all of that, I thought about it and it haunted me. And it was in my mind every day about like, this is serious, man. This is very serious. What did you do when you graduated high school last year? What did I do? At 36 years old. Do you celebrate? Go back to work? I went back to work, man. I worked up until that morning and then I gave the commencement speech, accepted my diploma. My mom was there, my dad was there, my brother was there, my niece was there, a couple friends was there. Lorene Powell Jobs came. She was there that morning as well, which was very special to me given where I'm at right now, you know? And it was an amazing day. Amazing day, you know? Because I never thought I would ever see that. But they came here, sat where you sat, and they told me they were ready to right the wrong. And I appreciated that. So that's that. That's not been the last 10 years, but that's been up until about 2011. But first thing that was really important to me in coming to Los Angeles was to see if I could actually manifest the idea of what Jimmy was talking about, which was you're your own fiefdom, if I can actually recreate it someplace else. So the first artist that I signed with the help of a fellow who works for me by the name of John Eamon was Lana Del Rey. That signing was important because I wanted to do the antithesis of what I had done at J Records. And it's very easy, especially when you're a person of color, to be typecast and pigeonholed. You can only do one thing or you're a one-trick pony kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that was important to me to be able to do that and to break her on an international level. But it didn't come without a lot of paper cuts. I didn't really have the belief in the backing of the Top 40 radio department at all at Interscope at the time, frankly speaking. That's when I actually, based on necessity and resourcefulness, became acquainted with the world of streaming and what that meant in video and content and understanding that if I wasn't going to be able to have a chummy relationship with the head of promotion and how my records fly on Kiss FM and Z100, I better damn sure be able to figure it out myself with my artists because I didn't come to LA with my team and get fired, humiliated like that, embarrassed like that to come out here to be a failure. Lana was offered two times the money to sign with Sony at the time than she was to sign with me, but we connected. We were creative kindred spirits and we saw a very similar vision as to what we could achieve together it worked. It worked through creating content. It worked through hustling and creating videos when we didn't have a lot of money. I would go to Jimmy and say, man, like, Jimmy, I can't get arrested with a top 40 department. So why don't you give me the 200 grand that you would otherwise spend to try to get the record on the radio? I don't even care about even going to top 40 radio. Let me have that money and let me repurpose and reallocate that money back into our visual content because I believe in YouTube and I believe in the power of that. And that's bigger than MTV. And then if we make her a very strong visual artist, and I'm not reinventing the wheel, you just did this with Lady Gaga and made her an international global superstar. I'm saying this because I admired what you were doing from where I was at in New York, and I saw that. So now I'm joined forces with you. Let me do that. But you're not going to give me the money that I need to scale the vision. So let's just say, fuck going to radio. Let me reinvest that money back into what we're doing for visual content. And I believe that what we're doing is so bold, different, and daring that it will travel the world. And that's what we did. So we created video games. Lana did that with her sister Caroline. I think that video cost like 40 grand. We did um, Born to Die, which otherwise in other hands would probably been a 400 grand video. That cost us $69,000 with Woodkid, video director with a friend, lives in Paris. And um, we had like two Bengal tigers in that video, car explosions, <laughs> whole thing, man. Video, it's got to be like a 300 million views or something like that on YouTube. I don't know. I wrote this other treatment with Lana called National Anthem with my friend Anthony Mandler. Yep. And Anthony and I still work together. We've done all these Apple Music commercial campaigns together and whatnot. Next thing I know, I look up and she's the number one artist in the world. Female. Number one most searched female artist on Google. Number one artist on Spotify. And uh, last I checked, it actually is a, earlier this year, our debut album, Born to Die, was the third album of all time next to Carole King's Tapestry and Adele's 21 for the longest running album on the Billboard Top 200. What's the album? Born to Die. Born to Die. Yeah, Lana Del Rey. It's nine million albums sold now. I was able to really kind of just... Get your fiefdom. Yeah, rebuild it for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and then I signed another kid named Chief Keef who was another kind of 
awakening for me in terms of what streaming meant because I saw that this kid, Chief Keef, who I found on YouTube very early on in his career and signed him and went to the south side of Chicago, which is stricken with violence. Like I had no business being there whatsoever, literally, you know. Mm -hmm. It's worse than Kabul, Afghanistan, you know, in terms of violence. And here I am sitting in this room where we're in, might as well be the apartment, you know, his grandmother's studio apartment. And I'm there trying to convince his grandmother as to why I should sign him. On the one oath that I made to her was, she said, you better keep my grandbaby alive. I said, I know, Granny Johnson, I, I, I got it, you know. She said, no, you better keep my grandbaby alive. When you talk about like having relationships with artists, it's a different level when you have the grandmother of an artist who's become an overnight star saying, and he, he's living in war-torn south side of Chicago. And you know what that is, of course. You know, certainly if you read the news, that year alone, I believe they had a well over 700 homicides. You know, and I'm there like Mr. Magoo, you know, hanging out on the corner, signing the deal, like it's all good. Little did I know that the car that's following us while I'm there to sign the deal, because I'm like, I asked the guy when he drops me off at the airport, his man, I was like, man, you see that car that's been following us all day? That Infinity has been following us all day? He's like, yeah, what about it? I said, they've been following us all day. What do you mean, what about it? He's like, they keeping us safe. You don't get it? They keeping us safe. So these guys were following us with protection. Yeah. yeah. Even that realization didn't even like quell my hunger to like go out there like another half a dozen times to go and like get the records done and to like immerse myself in the culture to understand what was happening out there, you know, on any kind of level. But what also found out while I was out there, I was probably a dozen times actually, that there was a hit out on this kid's life for like $50,000. I mean, this is a long way away from Whitney Houston. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I'm out here putting myself in harm's way. Why'd you do it? Because I believed that when I saw this kid in his video, it reminded me of when I was a kid and, and I saw Nirvana smells like teen spirit for the first time. It inspired me yet disturbed me to my core at the same time. It was a record called Don't Like. That's that shit I don't like, don't like. Kanye remade the record. Yeah. When I heard the record, I was like, man, this is like really special. And that record, that video is like well over 100 million probably views on YouTube now. It was taken down and re-uploaded or whatever. But at that time, which is the case now, Billboard didn't really look at YouTube as any kind of way that should influence the, the Hot 100 chart. So that record we're out today, and now Billboard honors YouTube video views, it'd be like a top five Hot 100 record. But I felt like that record had such a cultural impact at that time that it was really kind of worth on some level like me putting my life in jeopardy to usher in this music at Interscope. Yeah, I think it goes back to your being so loyal to the artist and the creator process and to yourself. It brings something out in yourself to be aligned with the creator of talent and content and video. Yeah, it's very important to me. There's a sanctity in that regard around that process to me. It's a purpose. It's a purpose, yes. I honored his grandmother's wishes and I, I moved him out of Chicago. I wrote letters to the judge. He went to jail one time, but I've kept him out of jail probably another three times. He became like a son to me, you know? But that's the personal side. The professional side was like, we would have Brooke Michael Kane, who was our head of social at the time at Interscope, would prepare reports for me and Jimmy and other people at the company in terms of social media activity at the time. And this was all budding, early days of Twitter, no Instagram yet, YouTube, you know. And we would see how these artists were performing, you know. I would see that this kid, Chief Keith, was outperforming Maroon 5 and Lady Gaga any given day, two to one, three to one, respectively, and social media activity for Interscope. But it wasn't translating to sales and it wasn't translating to Hot 100. So I just realized, man, there's something going on here, man. It's bigger than just this kid. And I was also managing Kanye West at the same time, too. And I was seeing what was happening with the Yeezus album. And actually, that's when I kind of came up with the idea about doing exclusives because I called Daniel Eck. And I said to him during the time when I was working with Kanye, I said, man, because we couldn't get the money from Def Jam to really market the album the way that I felt that it should be marketed. Kanye felt that it should be marketed. I called up Daniel and I was like, man, I got an idea. How about this? I love what you did with the Daft Punk, Some Random Memories album. Marketing was fantastic. It was great. But I said, how about you take it on the level up? We don't give the album to Apple. We give the album just, just to Spotify. <laughs> and you pay us for that level of exclusivity with one of the biggest artists in the world. What would that be worth to you? I said, I don't know, man. I don't love the idea. But, you know, I said, no, nah, this is a big idea. I don't think you understand. 
What if we were really willing to do this? I haven't even talked this over with the label. We were close. We were almost like at least handshake or signature. And then actually uh, Kanye and Daniel had their first child that at literally the same week. And uh, not together, not together. No, of course, <laughs> both of their wives gave birth that week to their respective children and it just kind of got derailed. But I never forgot that thought, followed it to memory, knew that I would come back to it one day. And then lo and behold, I end up at Apple after Apple buys Beats. Uh, Eddie Q drove the deal and it was like, oh shit, that's an idea. That's the idea. You know, if you want to scale your business really quickly, especially six years behind a competitor. Do you align with a platform? Yeah. The you platform gotta, can blow it out. Yeah, you got to create the Golden State Warriors. But the idea really is that there's an intersection between the musician, the songwriter, the content producer, and the platform, really the, the customers, the subscribers, on a very integral level. It's not two separate businesses. You're the bridge between those two things. And that's how you create the real value. Everything like right now presently always kind of felt like an allergic reaction to like the later years of my time in the record business, you know, truly like an allergic reaction. Like the last straw for me was I was working on this artist video. We didn't have enough money. The concept is 125 grand. They were immovable off giving me 75 grand. I was immovable off the concept that I had created with the artist and I need the money to, to finish it. And I wasn't prepared to put up yet another 50 grand to like do it like I did. Got me fired before, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm out beating the pavement hustling and I'm on the phone with like Kraft, and they're talking to me about putting Miracle Whip in the video. <laughs> and I got to linger on the shot for like five seconds, you know? And they want to see the treatment. I was like, man, this feels like five years ago when I did this thing for the money again. This doesn't feel right at all. How did I get in this position where I'm on the phone with the fine people of craft and they're looking over my video treatment and they're telling me I got to put Miracle Whip in to like pimp ourselves out for 50 grand and I got to linger on the shot for five seconds? It's just like, man, this is not it at all. That was the last straw, to be honest with you. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. This is terrible. I feel like, uh, I feel cheap, you know? Selling out. 100%. That's what made it easy to kind of do what I'm doing at Apple because I knew ultimately if I felt like that and I knew that other artists felt like that. Like you got to put the, the car in the video and the car has got to be in slow motion for like 10 seconds. You know, you got to put the liquor bottle in the video and then the liquor bottle, you got to hold it up for like five seconds. And this has nothing to do with art. Zero. It's commerce. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I saw that it was affecting people's art and it was affecting their moods and it was affecting how artists also viewed, you know, the system as well. And I felt like, wow, if we could have a coffer that we could go out and make content without all those other encumbrances. And I'm not dictating that this has got to be, you know, you got to hold the liquor bottle, and hi hold it a little higher. I need, <laughs> I need five seconds on it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. the miracle whip. Can you adjust it on the table a little bit? You know what I mean? It's like, if I can come to the table without all those other encumbrances that muddy the waters of the art, that it was an unbeatable concept. It was such a winning concept. And then, Add to that the creative pedigree and panache that I have and my team has, my team Natalie and Scott and Alexa, that they have, you can't beat it. But you're at a place in Apple that at the heart of it is a hardware company, a technology company. How do you infuse that creative culture into a company of that size, mm -hmm. into a product that is selling iPhones or selling HomePods? How do you infuse that creative culture into the system? It's hard to do. Through people who believe in you again, which has been the case and the luck of my entire life. Eddie Q and Tim Cook and Jimmy Iovine believe in me. And, and the artists trust you to deliver it. Correct. Yeah. I so, mean, I'm not trying to oversimplify. It really is, quite frankly, that simple. Let's give people a sense of the scale mm -hmm. of Apple Music for a minute. Yes, sir. Because I do think... It's obviously a, a recent phenomenon, but growing yeah. incredibly fast. And yeah, yeah. Very I want to talk so. about where we're going in the industry, but just talk about the present for a second. Yeah. So Apple Music is Apple's streaming music service, and it's growing probably almost 100% a year to about $2 billion in revenue recently. Yeah. That is massive, but given the size of Apple overall, it's about 1% 
of the overall revenue mm -hmm. of Apple itself. Apple Music's already surpassed 40 million paid subscribers. Apple's U.S. subscriber account base has been growing about 5% a month, faster than Spotify. Assuming that pace continues, Apple will overtake Spotify in the world's biggest music market, this country, in the U.S., this summer. The company is a strong, obviously, uh, you know, diversified business in Apple overall, but Apple Music is one of its fastest-growing components. So how important is Apple Music to the overall ecosystem at the company? You know, it's, that's not for me to say, but I can tell you that the music is very important. I, you're probably a better qualified to answer that than me. The earnings call was yesterday. I mean, you know what it means to Wall Street better than I do. When you're doing your job every day, mm -hmm. running content on Apple Music, mm -hmm. it gets the senior level attention of the company? Yeah, it does. You know, because you want to do what is also on brand, responsibly so. Mm -hmm. Jimmy would say to me, oftentimes, you're not in Kansas anymore. What I particularly love about this particular chapter is, is really how much they really did believe in the vision. You know, you got to think about like what the recalibrated, reimagined mosaic of music and the faces who lead the company, the poster child, you know, or children rather, the company have been, and it's been Drake. You know, when we launched Apple Music, he was on stage with a classic dope vintage Apple jacket on, and he gave a really impassioned speech. And also that day, The Weeknd performed for the first time ever, Can't Feel My Face, which went on seven weeks later, become number one record in every country in the world. Abel, who's a friend, I convinced him. I begged him, actually. I said, please, I love this song so much. Do not release it to radio until this moment. Please do not do it. And I really kind of came up with an idea for that moment. Drake will do the speech in that regard. And then Abel will close out WWDC with you doing Can't Feel My Face, full production, whole thing, and then send the song to radio and everybody got to send it to you an hour later. But let that moment sizzle. And that's how we launched it. But that's different than... The stuff before that, which was Coldplay and those vibes and whatnot, you know, which I means a whole other different kind of edgy energy, you know what I mean? But it was pop, and it was where pop was today. It wasn't about the dad rock of it all. It was about this is pop right now. It was less so even three years ago. Like, everything changes. It's like Moore's Law. You know, I don't know if you know about Moore's Law. but I do, it, yeah. It, yeah, it, it connotes that the, the speed of a microprocessor doubles every 18 months. That's how fast culture changes even, even quicker. When especially I in a world of technology. Especially in a world of technology. These guys believed in the concept that I had when we had zero subscribers at that time. And I can't even believe that that, that all took place with zero juice, just the gift of gab, you know what I mean? Saying like, no, nah, please, come on, you know what I mean? Let, let's launch it this way. And it was a big moment too, you know, that Apple was coming out with this new product and whatnot, and it was there was a lot of momentum and curiosity and chatter behind it. Yeah, I mean, it was a reimagining of what the aesthetic could look like. And, you know, it was creating a whole new kind of starting lineup. And the Golden State Warriors have been such an inspiration to me, you know, to see how, you know, what that starting lineup is, how deep that bench is. Curry can come off the bench after being out for like seven, eight weeks and like put up close to 30 points last night. It's like, it's crazy. But that's how, you know, I view the relationships with the artists that I'm in business with because they all are Currys in their own right or LeBron in their own right. Yeah, superstars beyond. You're also giving them an opportunity to launch and distribute directly to the consumers through the Apple platform. That's a pretty big idea. Obviously, the artists must appreciate it, particularly given the scale that Apple has. But where do you think that leaves the labels, you know, long term? Answering this question is worse than hanging out in the south side of Chicago with Chief Keef. <laughs> it is. You know, that's why... Well, you came you see through. That, you, see that, you see that gate over there? <laughs> see that thing leaning up? That, I'm building a bigger gate for my house. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> the gate right now is like six feet. The other gate over there is like 11. <laughs> for the answer to this reason alone. Well, you can't make an impact like this and not <laughs> talk about where the shifts are occurring. Zero part of me is joking even about anything I just said, but not straight up, though. It's like, I mean, you know, you look at Airbnb... You know, my friend Brian Chesky, I remember when I sat with Brian Chesky at the Soho House because he was going to sponsor the Yeezus tour for us. And I love Brian Chesky, man. What a good guy, man. Like, I remember when he came out to New York. He may kill me for telling this story. But <laughs> I was like, Brian, you got to come. We're doing the VMAs tomorrow night, but I, I need you to meet with me and Ye about the Yeezus tour. And, and it was like, tomorrow? It's like, come on, man. You've never been to the VMAs before. And he said, where am I going to stay at? I said, I'm staying at the Nomad. He said, I can't be staying at the Nomad. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm on the Airbnb. Exactly. <laughs> I won't say what he ended up doing, you know what I mean? But he came out. But you look at like what Brian Chesky did or what Travis did at Uber. These are companies that were big disruptors and unseated the incumbents. And I remember being with Brian at the Soho house back in 2012 and him saying to me with bright-eyed ambition, I'm going to be bigger than all the hotel chains combined in the world. And I said, bullshit. He's like, nah, man, it's happening. I'm on track to do it. And now look at where he's at today. And I say that to say from an analogous perspective, when Moore's Law is quite frankly a real thing, the speed of technology and the agility of microprocessors doubles every 18 months. So does consumer behavior. And so does a shift. My generation, which is the iPod generation, you know, I was breastfed on the iPad, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> As a young adolescent, that's like the holy grail, you know, to genre business. And that's the part that really was like kind of like really disheartening to me about the business in particular here is like, you know, you've got the pop department, then you've got the urban department, and then they work urban radio and then pop radio. And it's like, it feels like colored fountain, white fountain to me. Because that's not how I listen to my music. That's not how I make my playlist. You may hear out Tupac's Joe to see how do you want it into like Bruce Springsteen, I'm on fire, into like Bob Marley's Could You Be Loved, into Lil Uzi Vert. People want it all into the Smiths. If I make you a playlist, you're not going to hear two hip hop records back to back. It is going to be broken up by Dylan and the Smiths and Springsteen and Marley. And the vibes of Marley run through this house. This house right here actually used to be the Marley compound. Rita lived here and Damien lived here and, you know, Marley kids lived in this house. Like, seriously, you know, being close to musicians is like super important to me on many levels. That's like was like a deciding factor why I chose to live here is because the Marleys lived here. You don't feel, I mean, like as a streaming platform, which is now the way of the world, you can coexist with the other parts of the ecosystem still. You don't look at it as a zero sum game, do you? When you say other parts of the ecosystem, what do you like mean? Like the labels? Yeah, definitely. Businesses. Man, I was in New York last week for 36 hours. My 36 hours consisted of, I flew there with Jimmy and Patty Smith, incredible conversation for five hours to New York with Patty Smith. Land, I had dinner with Jimmy, got up the next morning. I saw my friend Monty Littman, who was the chairman of Republic Records, biggest great, record label in the guy. business, great guy. Spent three hours with him in his office. We had great conversation, talking about everything. Respect. Respect. And then, you know, that night I was at the Beacon with Patti Smith, got Bruce Springsteen to come out. Next morning I was back up. I had two-hour breakfast before meeting Jimmy back at the plane with Rob Stringer, who's the chairman of Sony Music Worldwide. I went to him, saw him at his favorite breakfast spot down in Gramercy Park. Respect, man, you know? These guys are great guys, and they really deeply care about the music. They're very passionate about it. I got nothing but respect for those guys, man, on the deepest level, you know, because... Just like they're getting the call from one of the artists, I'm getting the call from one of the artists, you know? I mean, we're both kind of in the same position. And they would be quick to tell you, too, that there has been a shift in the realignment of distribution of power, I suppose, in that regard. But, um, but I will be. say this. At least the artists don't have to put Miracle Whip in their videos anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the people that craft. You Liquor know? bottles. Liquor bottles, you know? I think it's a good thing for everybody. But, you know, no one's here to eat anybody's lunch. Everyone is benefiting right now. Dude, I'll tell you this, man, like, immodestly so, you know, I'm, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. You know, the business was trucking along, you know, for a while. In 2012, in the U.S. in particular, total paid audio subscriptions uh, were at 3.4 million in the U.S. 2013, there were 6.2 million. 2014, 7.7 .7 million. 2015, 10.8 million. Apple Music comes into the marketplace. And we decide, okay, we're not going to treat this just as a utility. We're not going to treat the labels like they should be lucky to get us on the phone. Or we're doing them a favor. We're happy to be in partnership with them, in concert with them. And what happens in 2016, once that happens, because we came into the marketplace, as you know, in July of 2015, the business jumps from 10.8 in 2015 to 22.7 in 2016. That wasn't by accident. And now as of this year, 36 in the U.S. So if I had to make a direct correlation, you know, with what's happening in, um, in the business, I think our emergence of the marketplace, Jimmy and me bringing a, a real panache and P.T. Barnum kind of je ne sais quoi magic to the marketing of it all and kind of viewing what we had experienced in the record business as what we're doing now is kind of allergic reaction to what we experienced then and empathizing with guys like Monty and guys like Rob how tight the purse strings were because the business was still trying to find its footing, find itself back. 
it was better for it to be a couple players in a market versus just one. Do you have the same respect for Apple Music's competition, like your friend Daniel Ek and our friend Daniel Ek and Spotify and Google? How do you think about it on that basis? I think a lot of the things that we did from a marketing perspective, and I think that they would admit this as well and definitely say this and validate what I'm saying, like coming on and, and doing what we did with such gusto and such vigor from what we do with Beats One to what we do with outdoor marketing to what we do with our commercials. You know, the commercials, what we've done have been huge, man. Documentaries and the short form content and the videos, none of that existed before we came into the marketplace whatsoever. But how I feel about it is like, you know, I'm looking at that Michael Jackson Tashin book underneath my coffee table over there. And it kind of evokes this analogy. It's like when Michael Jackson came out with the moonwalk on Motown 25, somebody was doing the moonwalk a year later. So then he had to come up with new dance steps. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You have to reinvent yourself. You got to reinvent yourself. And, but he's uh, known for the moonwalk to this day. He's known for the moonwalk to this day. You know, he's got a couple of other steps. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, you become known for certain dance steps. But somebody bites your choreography, you got to come up with new choreography. So the so, competition makes everyone better. Yeah, for sure. Because after I'm done with you, I'm going right to the dance studio to come up with some new dance steps in my office in there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Straight up, you know, a new moonwalk, you know, that's the fun of it all because you don't ever become complacent in any regard. Yeah. So sticking with the theme of the artist and the platform together, you at Apple just bought or acquired Ed Sheeran's new documentary rights, the global rights for the new documentary. Yeah, very exciting. So you're going to be releasing that not only through Apple Music, but also theatrically. In limited run, correct, yeah. Right. I mean, do you envision that to be a distribution strategy that you're going to keep emulating for other content that you acquire rights to? It's not the first time. We did it with Puffy's Can't Stop, Won't Stop. We did a, a week-long theatrical run in New York, in L.A. We debuted the film in London. We had a theatrical premiere in L.A. at the Screen Actors Guild Theater. That premiere felt, to me, like one of the best premieres I've been to in a long time. Everybody was there from Chris Brown to Kendrick Lamar to Dre to Jimmy. My friend Courtney Kardashian was there. Uh, Tyler Creator was there. Snoop and Wiz were smoking weed in the 10th row. It was bigger than the BET Awards. <laughs> yeah, it was, man. <laughs> no bullshit. Madonna was at the after party. It was crazy, man. And we did that all ourselves, you know, and with a very skeletal staff, just the, the hustle of me and Sean Combs putting that together. But we did a theatrical run leading up to the release so that we could qualify and we won a few awards as a result of it. And then um, we did it for Clive Davis's film as well because Clive, rightfully so, wanted to make sure that that film could qualify for every award possible. But this one, yeah, it's really important. These things to me are no different than making records going back to life 10, 15 years ago. I remember seeing the film, watch it right here at midnight on a Saturday night, one night, 2 a.m. I called the filmmaker, Murray Cummings, Ed's cousin, I was like, Murray, I want the film. Can't sell the film to anybody else because I know. And I said the same thing to Puffy too. I know. I said with, with brash confidence, I know I'm the only home for this film. I know it. And by my saying that, I'm actually setting myself up to actually deliver on the promise of everything that I'm saying, you know, with such confidence because, you know, no one wants to be known as a person who doesn't do that. So, and I'm confident I was able to do that with Puffy and I'll do that with Ed. Because it's exciting to be in business with Ed, you know? We're in business with the number one and two artists in the world, Drake and Ed Sheeran. So, you know, the idea of what we always wanted to be was MTV. Because when I was coming up, and I'm sure when you were coming up, you kind of felt them being fans of MTV, which I'm assuming you were. Yes. That you felt like Madonna lived there, Michael Jackson lived there, Nirvana's doing the Unplugged, Jodeci's doing an Unplugged. You felt like Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch lived at spring break. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> these people were... That was a were, cultural beacon. Yeah, these people were furniture at the network. They literally were furniture. You, when you thought of MTV, you thought of Yo! MTV Raps. You thought of Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. You thought of MC Hammer. You thought of Michael Jackson. You, these artists were fixtures and furniture at the network. It doesn't happen because you think that it should happen. It happens because, you know, you guys sit down and very thoughtfully and very methodically decide that you want to make great stuff together. Now, I want to move to a different topic yes, that sir. is um, incredibly important and impactful. And I, I'm going to point it out, and I know it's not a defining feature of the way you think about your career so far, but it is, I think, momentous. that You are, at Apple, probably the only African-American 
senior executive at the company, maybe across the technology industry with a few exceptions. There is also Lisa Jackson, who deals with environmental and government issues, who's amazing. I mean, we got the same last name, same letter for our first name, you know? I mean, I love Lisa. That's my big cousin, big sister, you know? I mean... I'm sure significant for her too, but talk about you and what that means to you. That's what I'm most focused on, not about Apple or a statement on the industry, but really about Larry Jackson. It means to me that it's dangerous for me to be doing this podcast with you. <laughs> you shoulder a responsibility. Yeah, but it also doesn't mean for me that like I should cower or I should dim my light or I should um, change who I am in any regard because that's never been me. And as I've talked to you about earlier in this piece, that's never really resulted quite well for me. But I have the utmost respect for the company and the opportunity that it's afforded me and how it's catapulted me, you know, career-wise to the next level with people who just blindly believed in the vision that I had creatively in a lot of ways. But it does mean, yeah, that I've become acutely aware of the last 18 months in particular that as service has grown, has become a success, that there comes an inherent responsibility. Well, and I think you're also a trailblazer, right? You thrive in that role. Yeah, that's important, you know. I was offered opportunities that financially were a lot more lucrative than my taking this initially, you know. It's never been about that for me, you know. If I die two weeks from now and uh, you reflect on this conversation and you have positive feelings about the time we spent together and our friendship, that means more to me than, you know, whether or not the money that's in my account, they can line my casket with it. It's not really anything that is that important to me. What's important to me is if I'm able to be here with my little time on this earth to inspire people, to inspire other young African-American men and women and people of color. And that's what gets me out of bed every morning to really be able to like make things that are big, transformative changes that inspire other people who may not have graduated from high school, may not have graduated from college. Because that's what inspired me when I was a young guy. It wasn't somebody who was African-American. It was somebody actually, my friend who was working at KML, who was four years older than me. And he started off around the same time as me, about age, I want to say 14. I saw him. I was like, wow, that kid, he's, he was half Filipino, half Japanese. His name is Franzen Wong. Gave me my first internship. He was a young guy. Seeing him do it made me think that it was possible for me to do it because they took him seriously. The impact that that had on my life and how I viewed myself, and I know that others view me, makes it less about me, quite frankly. It makes it about, if I'm going to blaze a trail, I'm not blazing the trail for myself. I'm blazing the trail for the people behind me. Because if I'm gone, then I better leave that trail unencumbered, free, without any shrubbery, easy for that other person to get even farther than I got. But I respect that. And I think when we're on a podcast with these beautiful microphones, yeah. And- I'm in your ear and you're in my ear and yeah. we're in our listeners' ears. It's easy to get philosophical and think about the past. But the nicest thing about this is you're 37 years old. We have a lot more to accomplish. I want to see where you're going to go in life. Knock on wood. That's the sound of me knocking on wood. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah. the energy that you have and the platform you have and the relationship with your compatriots and artists in the industry and in the executive suite, allows you an opportunity to create a huge amount of impact in this world. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't mean that it's easy, you know? And thank God for Jimmy IV, man. Thank God for somebody who really understood and understands who I am from a DNA perspective and really was able to usher me into a company like this, you know, as this kind of like snow leopard to like <laughs> be able to have this kind of impact and affect this kind of change. I go to media slopes. People who aren't part of the world are beating down my door in any kind of way. I still don't think a lot of people get it, quite frankly, and understand like why the burger tastes like that, what the secret sauce is, you know? Why that tastes like that. Jimmy says it so perfectly. He and Eddie Q, man, they're brilliant guys, man. They really understand the why of what the differentiating factor, like why those truffle fries taste like that. You know what I mean? They're just not regular fries. They got that white truffle oil in them and why they taste like that and why you can charge $40 for truffle fries <laughs> you know, at a certain place. Well, Jimmy it, and I, when we all had breakfast this week, yeah. we learned something that you can yeah. replace almond milk with oat milk for your latte. You know what I'm saying? It could be a whole and new thing. it could thing. be a hit. Yeah. 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 But not everybody knows about the oat milk. It's not oat milk. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's still... A bit of a mystery, you know, which kind of actually really does underscore the importance of blazing a trail because 
If they don't get it, man, with me at all, then I hope they get it with the next guy, man, because you could have your music service and sign Garth Brooks, make him the poster child, but it's not 1992 anymore, man. It's not. And that's why you got to give Apple credit for embracing me, embracing Drake, embracing Frank Ocean, embracing The Weeknd, embracing Travis Scott, embracing DJ Khaled like that and saying these guys are going to lead the musical charge for us. They're going to be the faces of it. We got people out here doing other things. Like it's like 20 years ago, 25 years ago even. And I could pop up at Media Slopes and, you know, give some hugs and have some great conversations and stuff like that. But it's a talent too. It's not like it's like such a fungible thing. I'm not trying to talk about it like that, but it's like there needs to be more people that you let in the door who have kind of a radical perspective like myself, other people who look like me to have a perspective like that, to infuse this level of culturalness. Like hip hop is the biggest genre in the world right now. I just sat with the editor-in-chief, my friend John Amato of Billboard. Puffy came and joined us mid-breakfast. He's like, yo, man, that article you wrote about how there are no black executives leading any of these companies, man, that was powerful, bro. That's what Puffy said to John Amato yesterday. And he's right. John said to me when Puffy left the table, he's like, man, it's so crazy. Puff said that because I never got so many calls about an article that I've ever written or had written rather. He's the editor-in-chief, had written about Billboard. But it's not just that the music companies, it's the technology companies. Again, hip-hop is the biggest genre in the world. And it's not just American stuff. You go to like the Netherlands and it's the biggest album there. P&L, they're the biggest act in France right now. Brothers who funded themselves in a very curious way, you know? Everybody wants to sign them and they won't sign. Why do you think they won't sign? Because you don't have anybody that looks like them there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I hope a lot of people hear this, man, because it's like, I don't know how to say it any louder. Like, you have to let people like us in. If you want to change it, you have to let people like us in. And you got to let new thinkers, new faces, new ideas in. That's going to be the oat milk. It's your purpose. Yeah. You know, and I'm not trying to go on some diatribe like a friend of mine, but, you know, I'm saying this from a very thoughtful place, you know, not from an erratic place. I'm saying this from a very thoughtful place. Maybe the message will land on someone, maybe it won't, but it's all good because the moonwalk doesn't look the same with everybody doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. It's been my pleasure, man. Thank you so much for coming over. I really appreciate it. It's been a long time coming. We're supposed to do this. This is the way it was supposed to be. This wasn't supposed to happen in Park City. It's supposed to happen here. I agree. Yeah. At your home. Yeah, indeed, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate the belief, by the way, that I feel that you have in me, and that means a lot to me. As they say in hip-hop, that's why I fuck with you so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go get them. Indeed. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our show today. If you want to check out any prior episodes, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Feel free to leave a review there as it helps people find the show. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at KindredCast for behind the scenes photos and info. Keep listening and see you next time. Audiation.